Hi everyone. We're about to look at the type 1 transposons that unlike type 2 or DNA transposons move via an RNA intermediate. They exist in all cell types but we'll focus on what we know about eukaryotic retrotransposons which have been extensively studied. If the name retrotransposon recalls the term retrovirus, as in the HIV or AIDS virus, it should. As we'll see, retroviruses and retrotransposons share a common evolutionary ancestry. First, let's look at the structure of different kinds of retrotransposons and at how they move. The yeast TY element is shown here as it would exist integrated into cellular genomic DNA. Like other transposons, active eukaryotic retrotransposons leave direct repeats of genomic DNA flanking the element after transposition. TY is an example of an LTR retrotransposon. These transposons are characterized by having long terminal repeat sequences, about 300 base pairs, flanking the genes in the element. The latter encode protein factors or enzymes required for transposition. GAG or GAG encodes group-specific antigen, a structural protein that forms a virus-like particle that will contain reverse transcribed transposon DNA. RT encodes reverse transcriptase that will make reverse transcribed copies of transcribed transposons. PRT encodes a protease that will break down the virus-like particle as the retroposon enters the nucleus. INT encodes integrase, required for integration of the transposon into genomic DNA at a site of insertion. Uh, just note the POL region. This consists of overlapping reading frames, also called ORFs or ORFs, encoding the PRT, the RT, and the INT genes. See if you can recall what overlapping ORFs really means. Lines are autonomous non-LTR retrotransposons. They encode enzymes needed for transposition and like other transposons generate target site direct repeats flanking the inserted element. But they don't have the long terminal repeats we just saw. Instead, flanking the open reading frames, those ORFs, are the 5' prime and 3' prime untranslated regions or UTRs. The reverse transcribed transposition-ready line retrotransposon will consist only of the DNA region symbolized here in yellow, I guess that's yellow, including the 5' prime and 3' prime untranslated regions or UTRs. Signs, or short interspersed nuclear elements, are non-autonomous, non-LTR retrotransposons. They are sometimes called retroposons, removing the trans prefix. This refers to the fact that signs encode no enzymes and can't transpose on their own. Like other transposons, signs generate target site direct repeats flanking the inserted element. Like lines, they lack LTRs and have instead 5' prime and 3' prime UTRs and can be transcribed. But as non-autonomous elements, signs lack the genes for enzymes needed for transposition. In fact, they typically lack any active genes. Therefore, their transposition requires the active assistance of, for example, a line. All autonomous retrotransposons share the following features. They have a promoter in the 5' UTR from which they can be transcribed. They all require the activity of a reverse transcriptase that will generate a cDNA copy of the transposable element. They require the activity of an RNase H, an endonuclease that degrades the transcript after reverse transcription. And they require the activity of an integrase, an enzyme similar to a transposase, that catalyzes the insertion of the retrotransposon copy at insertion sites. As already noted, Non-autonomous retroelements or retroposons lack these genes but get their protein products from the activity of an autonomous retrotransposon. 
there are two basic mechanisms of retrotransposition. These are extrachromosomally primed retrotransposition, which is characteristic of LTR retrotransposons, and target primed retrotransposition, characteristic of non-LTR elements. As we look at these mechanisms in more detail, remember that autonomous retrotransposons encode the activities they need for transposition and the activity of autonomous retrotransposons will be required for the mobility of those non-autonomous retrotransposons or retroposons, such as the signs. Let's look at extrachromosomally primed retrotransposition. Here, a double-stranded copy of the transcript of the transposon is produced. The ends of the DNA copy are held together by the integrase encoded by the transcript, forming a circular complex. This circular complex attacks or hydrolyzes target DNA shown in green here to begin insertion of the retrotransposon. Cut ends are trimmed to create staggered ends. Finally, DNA polymerase fills in the gap at the staggered cuts, ultimately creating the direct repeats, and ligase seals the DNA and transposition is finished, is complete. Target primed retrotransposition is typical of a sign. The enzymes involved in cleaving the target site DNA and in reverse transcription must come from the transcription and translation of genes in a concurrently active line. Target primed retrotransposition begins with transcription by RNA polymerase 3. After hydrolysis of one strand of target DNA at the insertion site and the annealing of the retrotransposon transcript, Reverse transcription is primed from the free 3' hydroxy end of that cut target strand. After hydrolysis of the second target DNA strand, reverse transcription of the second retrotransposon DNA strand is primed from the 3' end of the cut second target site DNA. This transposition intermediate is resolved by cleavage and insertion of the copied element into the target site DNA including the generation of the direct repeats of target site DNA. All right, let's turn our attention to some observations and questions that bear on transposon, indeed on genome evolution. So for example, genes for proteins typically represent only one or two percent of a eukaryotic genome. We've seen that before. So a question is, is most of the non-coding DNA in a genome non-essential to life? And if that's true, then are all those transposons also functionless? Are transposons, in fact, junk DNA or, or worse, selfish DNA, whose sole imperative is to replicate themselves? And if that's true, then why do transposons exist at all? Why hasn't natural selection gotten rid of them? Given the propensity of transposition to raise havoc in genomes, how do we tolerate them and how do we survive them? Well. Here is some of what we know about transposon evolution. Enzyme similarities exist between DNA transposons and retrotransposons. So for example, transposases and integrases that catalyze transposon insertion into target DNA share amino acid sequence similarity and similarity in the domain structure involved in integration. Among retrotransposons themselves, the same is true for reverse transcriptases. DNA sequence comparisons across transposons reveal that they occur in families of related sequences, indicating that during evolution, groups of sequences retain similarities while others diverge to have somewhat different sequences. Also, some transposon family members, like Mariner, for example, exist in almost all organisms across the eukaryotic spectrum. We noted the structure of the TY element, uh, and we noticed that it had a protein called GAG, which, if you remember, encodes a protein that will encapsulate the cDNA transcript of the retrotransposon. So the yeast TY element is an example of a retrotransposon that actually encapsulates its cDNA copy. While the protein-coded element in this case remains in the cell, the TY GAG gene seems to be serving the same function as genes for retroviral coat proteins. So what can we conclude? DNA and RNA transposons share a common ancestry. 
And furthermore, transposons have been around for much of evolutionary history. I suppose you could also make a preliminary conclusion here that retrotransposons and retroviruses might share common ancestry as well. So we can align retrotransposon sequences and retroviral sequences. So here we see aligned a retrotransposon transposase and a retroviral integrase sequence. And they show clearly a great deal of similarity, including a common DDE domain created when amino acids shown here in blue come together during polypeptide folding. Genetic engineering experiments that alter any one of these amino acids destroy the transposase or integrase activities blocking experimental transposition or experimental retroviral infection. This clearly supports retrovirus and retrotransposon common ancestry. So now the question is, which came first? Phylogenetic analysis of retrotransposon nucleotide sequences can shed some light on this question. The phylogenetic tree seen here is based on the alignment of many retroviral and retrotransposon nucleic acid sequences. Important nodes or branch points in the evolution of the elements are circled in red. These nodes represent putative common ancestors of retroviruses and retrotransposons. Since viruses cannot exist without cells to infect, the most likely explanation of these data is that the common ancestors of retroviruses and retrotransposons must have been retrotransposons. Some retrotransposons in the distant past, surely one with a protein coat, must have escaped the confines of the cell to become infectious virus particles. So, back to the questions. Are transposons useless, junk, or selfish DNA that exists only to replicate and perpetuate themselves? In fact, there's growing evidence that transposons have been useful in evolution. For example, transposons facilitate the phenomenon of exon shuffling, creating genetic diversity by creating genes with novel functions. They can do this in one of two ways. An example of how transposons can indirectly facilitate genetic diversity might be if, for example, two alu elements had independently inserted into introns on either side of an exon. The rather long alu DNA sequences could provide the sequence similarity needed to stabilize meiotic synapsis to allow unequal recombination with a different region of DNA also containing alu sequences. This could move the exon from one gene into a new, different gene. There it is. There's indirect facilitation. An example of how transposons can directly facilitate genetic diversity would be if two elements flanking an exon, again like the two allo elements, were to transpose as a single retrotransposon. If the target site in the genome were to be an intron of another gene, integration of this think of it as a composite element, would introduce an exon into the unsuspecting gene, again conferring a new extra function. This kind of transposition should remind you of how bacterial composite transposons work. There's even more evidence for the value of so-called non-coding DNA in our genomes, including transposons and even other repetitive DNA. Similarities between genes and enzymes of transposons and those involved in antibody gene rearrangements point to a role of transposons in the evolution of the immune system, a major event increasing genetic diversity in higher animals. Despite the potential of transposons to cause problematic mutations, they, along with all the rest of the repetitive DNA in our genomes, may actually serve as a buffer against deleterious mutations that would otherwise disable our protein coding genes. In addition to any specific functions it may have, all that extra DNA in a genome simply creates a bigger target for random mutations that then simply miss the protein coding genes. So there's ample evidence to suggest that retrotransposons and retroviruses share a common ancestor, and that organisms, especially eukaryotes, do not carry an onerous load of useless DNA baggage. In fact, as we'll see in another chapter, some of the so-called junk DNA is actually transcribed, other than transposons. And we're beginning to discover roles for these transcripts. And on that positive note, we end this presentation.